Hello, and thank you for joining today. My name is David Gabor, and I'm a partner with the Wagner Law Group. Today, we're going to talk about a playbook for success in managing remote workforces. For those who are watching this webinar live today, April 17, 2020, happens to be National Blah Blah Day. I certainly hope that it is not a harbinger of things to come. So let's get cracking. Scores of employees are working remotely who have not done so before. There was no time to prepare their teams to work remotely. And as a result, employers have been reactive. There was just no time to prepare. And what we're going to do today is talk about ways to shift employment practices from reactive to proactive to minimize legal risks and maximize business advantages. That's why the program today. Policy manuals were created based upon a very different work environment. Unfortunately, it, ha it was unrealistic for employers to anticipate that all or nearly all employees would be working remotely. As a result, many, if not most, policies do not adequately provide for a remote workforce. Similarly, employers have not had the opportunity to clearly define expectations and goals for a remote workforce. Managers have not been trained on how to manage remotely. The lack of training leads to potential risks involving privacy, wage and hour, unclear or improper communication, and problems and challenges arising out of remote reporting. The business risks concern productivity, employee engagement, poor follow-up, accountability, and the impact all of this has on brand. Legal risks, I'm sorry to say, include problems with tracking the time employees work, people working before and after their shifts, failure to allow for break time, harassment, and bullying. Also, employees are entitled to the same protections afforded to other people in the states where they actually are doing the work as opposed to where the office was. Let's look at an example. An employee who works for Schembechler Steel in Toledo, Ohio, but happens to reside in Lambertville, Michigan, and is now working remotely, is actually going to be protected under Michigan law and not Ohio law during the time that they're working remotely. That becomes an even greater issue if more and more people continue to work remotely for weeks, months, and seasons on end. So employers should be creating a checklist of rights that employees have in the states where they're actually working. So it's time to prepare for what lies ahead. So let's talk about some of these challenges. Feeling a sense of loneliness and isolation. Over time, one of the challenges facing telecommuters is that they feel sometimes like they're on an island. That feeling is exacerbated by the COVID-19 emergency and the fact that there are many people who are working remotely who never planned on it and emotionally have not become ready to embrace remote work. Communicating with others is also an issue. Without face-to-face -face communication, it can become difficult to understand the tone of emails and text messages. Face-to-face -face communications are easier because people rely on nonverbal cues. Messaging can be and often misinterpreted, especially when received by a person who is unaccustomed to working remotely. That leads to a feeling of being disconnected. It is really helpful to take a moment to appreciate that some of your employees are going to feel as though they have been left out and, un and are disconnected from the coworkers. You can address this by taking to build a rapport with telecommuters by having regularly scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings and group team meetings with the people. And it goes back to training your managers. 
taking breaks. Employees in the office will take a break. They're going to grab coffee or some other caffeinated call that wake up juice. And it helps to remind remote workers they can also take breaks. And in fact, they can even schedule a break with a coworker, grab coffee and talk to somebody for five minutes. I think that's something that we wanted to start to promote in our workplace. It helps to build camaraderie. People sometimes feel as though they can send messages whenever the mood strikes. This can lead to overtime issues. It can lead to burnout. It can lead to poor morale and poor employee engagement. If people feel like they're being abused by getting messages early in the day, late in the day, and on the weekend, and they don't have any time that's their own. This leads to making sure that our team is motivated. How do we do that? Every team is different and every individual is different. Find what works in your organization. It might be positive feedback. It could be positive interaction. But find what works and then stay with that. And this leads to distractions. While telecommuters do not need to deal with distractions that occur in the office, they are now dealing with distractions in their home office. This is especially true when people have children, siblings, parents living with them, and they don't have the space to do things the way they would necessarily in the office. And it might be that flexibility is the answer. If a person is trying to work and also they've got their kids at home, it might help that their workday starts earlier or later, or they take their lunch hour earlier or later. Think about different things that you can do to help facilitate a good telecommuting work experience. So it is important for telecommuters and their teams to have a regular morning routine. Let's start with the individuals and their routine. It used to be you get up, you, you, you catch a train, a bus, you drive, you leave typically at the same time every day, you go to the office, you might stop, grab coffee. Now you're working from home, and that's fine. But I think that when people are working from home, they should have a routine also. Try to get up at the same time every day. Try to do the same routine before the workday starts. It's going to help them to become better assimilated in this new role that they have. Now, there are many who are going to feel that this working from home is horrible. It's a terrible thing. They feel, you know, that they're put upon and they're not all that happy with it. So shift the, perspe the perspective, change the narrative. Talk about the fact that they don't have to spend the time commuting, whether the commute is 10 minutes or an hour and a half. What, whatever that commute is, they no longer have it. That gives them extra time. They can spend it with their family. They can sleep a half hour later or whatever. They, they have time to partake in a hobby, a relaxation, yoga, meditation. They, they have an opportunity to communicate with family members that they did not have before. They can engage in exercise. These are different things they can do. In fact, I know many people now who are going out and taking walks, and they're purposeful about it. And in fact, many have commented that because there are less cars on the road, the air is clearer, they see the stars at night, and they're actually enjoying that. So then we get to the office routine, and, and that's so different because of the fact that people are remote. But you know what? We create a new routine, whether it's using a video conferencing, Zoom or some other platform, or phone meetings. You can create new routines in the office, and you can make it a really good experience for people, but take the time to come up with what works in your organization. So the journey to a great telecommuting program starts with an assessment of existing policies 
and that can and should be changed to address the new work dynamic. This includes how people communicate, how we document communication, whether we adequately address work schedules, work hours, accountability for projects, how we communicate with one another, privacy, vacation schedules. These are among many considerations. Telecommuting works well when clear expectations are set. Therefore, managers and telecommuters should agree to core hours when the telecommuter and the managers must be available. Telecommuters should also understand what is expected of them. What goals are they expected to meet? What are the deadlines for a specific project? Provide guidelines for telecommuters such as emails must be responded to within X number of hours, certainly no more than 24, maybe 10, and use text messaging only for urgent matters where you need to get in touch with somebody and then make sure you can document that communication or just pick up the phone. And here's a tip, and there will be several others during the course of the program. Consider focusing on what is being accomplished for the time being, what an employee accomplishes is more important than the number of hours spent on a given project. We may need to adjust expectations because telecommuters may be working hard, but they are not as efficient as they may have otherwise been in the office. Establish guidelines. These are intended to ensure that telecommuters must be paid the same as employees in the office who have the same or a similar position. For example, a discrimination issue arises if the majority of the telecommuters are women who are paid less than their colleagues in the office who have the same or similar jobs. In addition, the goals and expectations should be the same for telecommuters and employees in the office. This can be addressed by creating clear job descriptions that outline guidelines and expectations for the employees. If telework is being provided as a reasonable accommodation for a qualified individual with a disability or if required by a union or an employment contract, then you should pay the same hourly rate or salary. Another tip, managers may be telecommuting for the first time and like the employees, they may very well need support. Let's talk about paying the employees. The FLSA requirements regarding minimum wage and overtime apply to non-exempt employees who telecommute. Salaried exempt employees generally must receive their full salary in any week in which they perform any work subject to certain very limited exceptions. Now, non-exempt employees should be required to submit detailed timesheets showing services performed and the hours worked. And this is really important because it demonstrates that the minimum wage has been paid and that the telecommuting hourly employees have been paid for all hours worked. Keep in mind, overtime kicks in when they exceed 40 hours of work. Here's another tip. Make sure that your non-exempt and hourly employees are accurately recording their time. If a manager giving them work before or after their shift or emailing or talking on the phone with them before or after a shift, even if the manager is encouraging the employee not to put down the time, the employee would still be entitled to overtime. That legal obligation does not change even if the employee recorded 40 hours when they in fact worked 42, 43, 45, or even 50 hours. Breaks, different states, different laws and regs regarding breaks for people working a full day. Make sure that the employees are taking their breaks even when they're working from home. This has got to be clearly communicated to them because if an employee is not taking breaks, even if they're encouraged to do so, the employer may have a financial liability. Now, what happens when you require telecommuting? During a pandemic or a health emergency, an employer may encourage or require employees to telework as an infection control or prevention strategy, including based on timely information they receive from a public health authority about things like pandemics. Telework also may be a reasonable accommodation. Of course, employers must not single out any one group of protected people 
for telework because this runs the risk of a possible disparate impact, disparate treatment type of litigation, and we do want to avoid that. Another tip, it may be necessary to ask employees to perform tasks that they that are not included in their job descriptions. So if a manager is changing the responsibility that an employee has, it's critical that HR is aware of that. One reason is that a person who's performing different functions at this time may no longer be exempt from overtime and they may be entitled to get paid time and a half or things along those lines. So it's very important to make sure that HR is aware of what's going on, and this necessitates good communication between managers and HR. HR should be making sure that managers are aware of that ASAP. Note, the OSHA does not have any regulations regarding telework in home offices. In February 2000, OSHA issued a directive stating that the agency will not conduct inspections of employees' home offices, will not hold employers liable for employees' home offices, and does not expect employers to inspect the home offices of their employees. Wait a minute, hold on. That's not a note. That's actually something good. Now, what about leave during a pandemic or health emergency? An employer that offers a bona fide benefits plan or vacation time to its employees may require that such accrued leave or vacation time be taken on a specific day or days. This will not affect the employee's salary basis of payment if the employee still receives in payment an amount equal to the employee's guaranteed salary. However, an employee will not be considered paid on a salary basis if deductions from the predetermined compensation are made for absences occasioned by the office closure during a week in which the employee performs any work. Exempt salaried employees are not required to be paid their salary in weeks in which they perform no work. Therefore, a private employer may direct exempt staff to take vacation or debit the relief bank account in the case of an office closure, whether for a full or partial day, provided the employees receive in payment an amount equal to their guaranteed salary. In the same scenario, an exempt employee who has no accrued benefits in the leave bank account or has limited accrued leave and the reduction would result in a negative balance in the leave bank account, still must receive the employee's guaranteed salary for any absences occasioned by the office closure in order to remain exempt. Sorry about that. Train, let's talk about training managers. Managers who have to work with the team in the office need to be trained on working with the team remotely. And it's special attention should be paid to issues involving leave, issues involving the hours worked, overtime, you know, rest breaks, how they need to communicate with their teams, to be very much aware of the fact that terse, short, tense, Electronic communication can lead to a claim of a hostile work environment or even bullying. They need to learn how to listen, how to know when they need to escalate and bring something to the attention of HR. And I think in this environment, one feedback I've had is that there's been some hostile work environment claims made by Asian Americans over the last couple of weeks. Let's be aware of that. And Let's talk about the expectations. They should be clearly communicated to the tele telecommuters. Now, it's one thing to put it in writing. It's another thing to confirm it in a phone call and have an opportunity to go back and forth with your team. Talk about what your expectations are. Get feedback from the employees. Make this a commitment. Yes, I agree. That's a good idea. I can do that. Have that kind of conversation. 
It's always important to be flexible with employees to deal with the unexpected. In the COVID-19 scenario, flexibility is even more important. For example, because schools are closed, we may need to fl have flex schedules for the employees. As a result, let's be more flexible, but at the same time, if you are flexible with one person and you're not flexible with another, you're opening yourself up to a potential disparate treatment claim. So let's be sure to be co consistent in that flexibility. Treating telecommuters in the same manner as other employees. This is critical to prevent any appearance of discrimination or bias. For example, if a majority of the employees are women who are telecommuting, and they are not given the same opportunities as employees in the office, this could result in a claim of discrimination under Title VII, possibly under the ADA or under the ADEA. Here's another tip. Telecommuters should have the same access to managers as employees in the office. Remember, employees in the office see managers in the hall. Stop by the manager's office. It's very easy to get that face time. Telecommuters do not have that access and can feel distant. So it is important to respond to telecommuters as soon as possible. Keep them in the loop. Establish and maintain rapport with all employees, remote and the people who are standing in front of you. Balancing workloads. It's easy for an employee in an office to become overwhelmed when several different people throw work their way. It's even easier for that to happen with remote workers. Make sure that you've got a clear understanding of what the responsibilities are for the people on the team. And if you give work to them, make sure that they're able to tell you that they're also getting work from Bob and Ted and Allison so that they, you know that if you're giving something to a person, whether or not they can get that work done. Make sure that the people who are junior to you feel comfortable telling you if they've got more work than they can handle. They've got to feel comfortable communicating with you. Here's a tip. It's easy to treat telecommuters as if they are available 24-7. Telecommuters are people too. They need their evenings, they need their weekends, they need their lunch hour, just like people working in the office need that time. Be respectful of their personal space. Calls between certain hours should be discouraged, absent an emergency, to make sure that telecommuters are not working around the clock. And let's talk about access to sick leave, vacation, and other paid leave. Employees who telecommute must have the same access to sick leave, vacation, and other forms of paid leave, just like other employees. Just because an employee works from home does not mean that he or she should be available while on sick leave, vacation, or other forms of paid leave any more than any other employee. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the slides. Here we go. Maintain privacy. Telecommuters should not be required to use their personal phones or email addresses for business use. Furthermore, telecommuters' personal phone numbers and email addresses should not be shared with other employees, clients, or service providers. Human resources may require personal phone numbers or email addresses for the employee's personnel file, but the information should not be shared with other employees. This is important for several reasons, privacy being one. It also minimizes the risk of a hostile work environment. You have a person's home phone number and you start harassing that person for whatever reason, we're staring at a significant lawsuit down the road. It's important to engage with telecommuters on a daily basis through some kind of communication. Managers can use multiple channels to communicate. Face-to-face -face meetings should be held weekly or monthly or even more often depending upon your situation. This type of interaction will help telecommuters feel included 
in the company, in the projects, in what you guys are doing. If a manager senses miscommunication with a telecommuter, it should be addressed as soon as possible, not when you feel like it, as soon as possible. It should be that same day. Ask them to call or make time to ask about it. Again, face-to-face -face meetings help minimize the risk of miscommunication. Addressing problems while they are small is absolutely critical. And we talk about isolation. I know this was mentioned earlier, but it, it bears repeating. Address feelings of isolation and encourage telecommuters to get out of the house on a daily basis. Of course, we've got to be mindful of social distancing, something that we never thought of a couple of months ago, and now it's being used all the time. Uh, but get people to do things that are healthy, that help them feel like their days are full and they're rich, and that's really important. Um, let's talk about video-based coaching. It's important to schedule face-to-face -face time. Silence becomes loud and dangerous as telecommuters might end up wondering how they're doing because more than half of human communication is nonverbal. The best way to handle this is to give telecommuters a full hour every week for one-on-one -on -one meetings. It enables managers to address a, vi a variety of topics really dive into issues that would not otherwise be addressed because the telecommuters are not in the office. And here's another tip and a very important one. Think about coaches. A good coach can help the employees and managers adapt to changes in their work environment and what's going on right now. It can help a person who's challenged to flourish as an individual and as a key and integral member of a team. We think about, you know, some of these ideas I'm talking about, and you might say, oh, you know, David, that's soft. That's soft stuff. That's not major. It's soft. If you don't address this, when the economy starts to rebound, you can have turnover. You address this now, you will not have to turn over. So if a coach is going to help you to accomplish these goals, and a good coach will do that, Think about doing what's right for that individual and that individual's family, and at the same time, think about ROI. Let's talk about inclusivity. Often telecommuters are given secondary consideration. It can be addressed with virtual meetings and staff partnerships. A telecommuter who is teamed with an employee in the office can feel much more connected to the company. This should be a transition period with clear steps expectations, and check-in to ensure the process is fully embraced. So whether your organization is predominantly a virtual company or if your workforce is temporarily teleworking due to the current state of the world, remote work can have its obstacles. We talked about ways to overcome those obstacles. Here's a couple of other tips for you. And the first is not on the slide, documentation. Make sure that you have a plan to cover how your employees are going to document their interaction, whether it's internal communication or external communication. If they're doing things by text message, how are we making a record of these text messages? If we're talking about an interaction between an employee and a manager, that's by text, and the employee it claims at some point disparate treatment or a hostile work environment, we've got to make sure we've got those records of those text messages. Some companies have a platform to communicate internally and that communication is not preserved. That can become a problem at some point in litigation. So we have to think about that and think about it very seriously. Community, foster a sense of connectedness with your workforce through virtual meetings. Even if these get togethers are short, it helps to remind your employees that even Though they are working alone from their in individual silos, they are st still part of a team. Check in with your team members. How are you doing? How are you working on that pro project? Let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Let me know if you've got the tools to flourish in your job. 
Ask open-ended questions. Encourage full and frank responses. Technology can be helpful. Video conferencing helps to minimize the social isolation of the remote workforce. While we are able to communicate messages over the phone and email, seeing someone face-to-face -face allows you to feel better connected and also read their expressions and their body language. There are pitfalls. Be very careful about privacy. Make sure if you are video conferencing with clients that you know whether or not this conversation is being recorded. There are also people out there who are uninvited guests to some conversations on some platforms. Make sure that your cybersecurity is up to snuff. Train your team regarding phishing scams and malware attacks. Review your performance management plans. Update them based upon what's going on in the world today. And make sure you track outcomes and deliverables. Make your expectations clear and reasonable and follow up on it. So that concludes the webinar today. And I thank you very much for joining us. And if you've got any questions or comments or feedback, other than the fact that I'm not very good at advancing the slides in the pandemic, I will strive to improve next time. Certainly, please feel free to reach out to me. We are all going through a very difficult, challenging time. I am here, and I am most certainly happy to chat with you, whether or not it's just brainstorming or you've got an issue for my firm to handle. Thank you very much. Stay safe, people.